Thanks for this great opportunity uh, for us to present our work here. And uh, I'm going to talk about a new feature that we develop in the port in the Cibao Cancer Genomics Portal for visualizing and analyzing uh, clinical and genomic data for individual patients. Cibao Cancer Genomics Portal uh, is a web resource that is open access and for interactive uh, exploration of high dimensional cancer genomics data. Our goal is to lower the barriers between cancer genomics data and the cancer researchers, including well lab biologists and clinical researchers and computational biologists. Uh, with, with this portal, one can very quickly uh, visualize and analyze genomic alterations in an iterative and interactive way. And um, we hope that th with this portal, um, we, we can really help that the cancer researchers to translate the complex genomics data to uh, biological insights and clinical applications. I would like to mention one key abstraction, namely altered gene. We can see that a gene is altered if it is um, mutated or amplified or deleted. So this uh, simplifying concept actually um, it's very powerful and uh, uh, enables user to uh, d derive hypothesis regarding uh, frequently altered gene set or pathways. And we just released this patient view. Um, we aggregate, we aggregate, integrate diverse data sets and filter them and present them to the user. And we want to do something more interesting and more intelligent because tumor samples, uh, they, uh, oftentimes they have hundreds or even thousands of alterations. Which of them are relevant to the disease? And can we use this relevant events to define the choice of treatment? And actually, experts, are, they are pretty good at intuitively identifying them. Can we automate part of this process? And can we even improve it? So our goal is to develop an interactive system to facilitate personalized medicine research for cancer and ultimately guide the patient treatment. So in this uh, patient-centric view, we uh, integrate diverse data, uh, including clinical data and genomics data. So uh, the clinical data include patient information, disease status, and pathology reports. And uh, we are going to support tumor images and treatment data as well. And the main part is uh, the main part in the patient view is the molecular profiles. Currently, we support mutations and copy number alterations, and gene fusion and expression will be supported later. And after we get those alterations, next step we are uh, adding uh, functional and statistical annotation to those alterations, including uh, predicted mutation impact by mutation assessor and cancer gene annotations from Sanger cancer gene and COSMIC. And COSMIC uh, and the cohort context information, uh, such as significantly mutated genes or uh, copy number altered peaks. We also bring in drug data information and clinical trials from resources such as NCI drug knowledge base. And after we putting this together, we present this to uh, cancer researchers and uh, clinicians and uh, in an in interactive way. And we are also building a wiki system that can be used for the user for annotate specific tumors. Uh, enough said, so uh, this is an example of our released product uh, of the patient view in the current portal. In this particular case, this woman, this woman is a 69-year-old uh, serious ovarian patient uh, with stage three and grade three. And we can get more clinical data from here. And this, this summary view is uh, uh, basically summarize the mutation event and copy number events and I'm, I'm going to uh, take a, a, 
to, uh, take, take a few minutes to explain the detail and hopefully make this uh, not only colorful but also meaningful to you. Uh, this graph uh, plots copy number events and mutation events across the chromosomes. The copy number check plot the copy number segment. And uh, from here, we can see that actually this, in this patient, it's, the copy number is uh, pretty much altered. And this uh, same characteristic was observed in uh, ovar uh, serious ovarian cancer. And in the, the mutation check, is we plot the histogram of number of mutations across chromosomes. Uh, this is a scatter plot uh, of number of mutations and the fraction of copy number altered genome. Uh, each dot represents a tumor sample in the cohort study, and the red one is the patient we are currently viewing. In this panel, we list the, muta I mean, uh, the mutation events in this patient. In this patient, uh, there are totally 35 mutations, and four of them are reported as interesting by the portal based on free, uh, recurrence, uh, cosmic, or annotated cancer genes. The first mutation is a TP53 nonsense mutation. TP53 mutation is almost universal uh, in serious endometrioid. The second uh, mutation is a, a phosphatase 2 missense mutation. It is a recurrent mutation. There are 26 other samples in this study have uh, first mutated phosphatase 2. Three of them have the uh, mutation on the same amino acid. The music result also showing that it is a significant mutated gene or recurrent mutated gene. And it, is, uh, it has also overlap with the cosmic data. Uh, mutation assessor predict this uh, mutation to have a high functional impact. And from the 3D structure through the mutation assessor, clearly it is a mutation in the highly conserved region. Uh, in this panel, we list the copy number events. And there are totally 385 copy number, copy number altered genes, and 17 of them are reported as interesting. Uh, for example, the second one is reported because it's a recurrent gene and based on gestic, and um, it is actually a focal amplification. But for example, this EGFR actually is uh, reported because uh, of uh, annotated it's an annotated cancer gene, and it's a rare event. It's not recurred, and not in just like peaks, and, uh, but it, it could be interesting, and EGFI is a frequent, is a well-known drug target. For example, for this drug icon, we can get the drug information with clinical trial information linked. Uh, the second and third tab, we list all of the mutation and copy number alterations, and the fourth step, we also linked to the pathology report for this patient, if available. And from this patient view, we can link, to, link back to the cancer study view. Uh, the, can, uh, the cancer study view present of the clinical and uh, cancer genomics data in an iterative way. Or, for example, for the clinical data, we plot of the histogram and the pie charts, um, and they are all uh, interactive and can be cross-filtered. For example, uh, for this histology plot, if we click on the serious pie, then all of the serious cases in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in this plot will be selected, and immediately we can all observe that this patient is an outlier because it has a very low copy number alteration and has a lot, a lot of mutations, unlike other serious cases. And if we click into this patient and uh, have a look, clearly this patient 
almost has no copy number alteration and has, has a lot of uh, mutation events. And it has su such as a KRAS, et cetera, which are uncharacteristic to serious cases. Uh, therefore, make this case very suspicious. And back to the copy, uh, back to the cancer study page. We also list the significant mutated genes and uh, copy number peaks. Next, I will do a little bit demo in the next two minutes. I hope the internet is work. Okay, so this is the front page of the query page, and for uh, the time sake, let's select the endometrial case uh, for demo, and we leave this mutation and copy number change as default, and we can select some uh, genes from a music list, for example, this uh, beta catena and KRAS, and summit. This will bring us to a summary page, including a so-called uncle print. Um, yeah, this, um, from this uncle print, it is clear that uh, there are a lot of mutation events occurring in these two genes um, represented by this green dot. And let's look at these mutations. So here, in the mutation diagram, all of this, uh, not all, most of this uh, beta catena mutations occurs in the N-terminal area, and they have well-known functional impact, actually. If we sort this amino acid change, we can have, it's a very long list in the N-terminal. And uh, similarly for the QRAS, most of them actually, 35 of them actually occurred on the G12 position and if we sort, it's a long list of them, and they have well-known functional impact. Getting back to the summary page, there are six am amplified, six cases with amplified KRAS, and if we are interested uh, in whether this amplification is functional or not, we can have a look at the plot. Uh, select KRAS. And this is a plot uh, between a, a, a gene expression versus gestic, and this rightmost uh, rightmost plot. In this, from this rightmost plot, we can clearly see that there's at least one sample with a very high expression level of KRAS. And from this uh, uncle print, we can kind of spot a mutual exclusivity pattern. And uh, let's have a look at the p-value here is 0.02, which is significant. So the next question is why we still have this overlap, still have some uh, cases that have both mutated in both genes. And we can take a look at the, maybe the, the first one. Uh, this patient has a lot of mutations, more than 6,000 mutations. It could take a while to load it. Uh, and, but I think that this is exactly uh, the, 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 reason, the reason why uh, this patient has both mutations in, uh, has mutations in both genes because of the higher mutation account background. Okay, I will give up on this one, and I have a preloaded version here. So this uh, patient has a, a functional mutation, KRAS mutation, and a beta catena mutation is not well-known function here. Okay, for the time sake, okay, I was maybe show a little bit on the patient on the cancer study view. Oh, yeah, it is loaded. 
And the cancer study view actually uh, plots off the attributes and the scatter plot. And it, uh, the, the, the patient is remembered. And if we clear, then we clear all. And we can like select of the living patient with, uh, with recurrence and et cetera. Uh, with that, I would like uh, I stop. I would like to stop here because of time. And uh, we are going to have a workshop at the Alexandra Room. And with that, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, especially Nikki Schwartz. Uh, he's been managing this project and coming up with a lot of ideas uh, to the patient view. And uh, it is a joint effort of the whole team, including Ben Amon, owner Gideon and Boris, Ethan and Chris. Doc, Doc Levine from MSKCC provide a lot of feedback, and his group provide a lot, a lot of feedback to the portal and to the patient view. Thank you all. Uh, congratulations on the live demo. It's impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so what's the status of your clinical interface, you know, physicians using this, the, you, uh, you're gliding this all into some position where the uh, less academic clinician can use the tool? Yeah, we, I mean, uh, for now, we basically, uh, basically it's uh, for researchers, uh, clinical research, or uh, like cancer research, basic cancer research, but we're hoping that it really can be used in clinical setting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question when you're deriving the individual copy number alterations. Do you use the cohort context at all, or are you just looking at tumor versus normal for the, for, for the same patient? Um, the, uh, you, you mean? The uh, so when you're deriving the copy number alterations for a particular patient, uh -huh. do you just look at that particular patient's tumor data and, and normal data, or do you also include the cohort context like gistic information? Yeah, yeah, we, we use the gistic information actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, two more questions. Quick question. Um, Subha Madhav and Georgetown University, fantastic presentation. Thank you. I was wondering how much pre-processing occurs in the back end prior to loading the data into the CBIO portal. I mean, for all the 7,000 or so samples that you have on your portal, I can imagine you know, it takes quite a bit of time for the various data types that you're presenting here. So can you shed a little bit of light on what kind of pre-processing that you do before loading the data into the CBIO portal? Yeah, actually, uh, most of the data for the TCG, we get it from like five holes, and we have some pre-processing, uh, for example, for the, uh, for, for especially for the uh, expression data and the mutation data, we add a lot of annotation to the map file. And for the copy number data, we also have some pre-processing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot, and we have a people like in charge of managing those data and the pre-processing, and we have a whole pre pre-processing module. What quick follow-up. Oh, do you have a timeline for how long it takes for a particular study, let's say 100 samples with three different data types? I, timeline, you mean? Yeah, for pre-processing and getting it into CBIO. How long does it take? Uh, you, you mean that? About 100 sample study uh -huh. into the CBIO portal. OK, it, it may be like a few, 100, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, less than one hour. Uh -huh. OK, thank you. Last, last question. Yeah, I just have a quick comment, and maybe also for the community, so that uh, when many people think uh, if it's apparently a lab scientist, many people think about uh, like uh, bioinformatics software and tools as a black box. And uh, it's appreciated that you talk about the workflow, how to use the black box, but I think that uh, like uh, more insight, uh, more explanation to the lab scientist, uh, like uh, what's inside the black box, what's the computational approach, the limitations, why it can, what kind of work it can do, what kind of work it cannot do, so that uh, the inside of the black box, the more inside to the computational approach. So that will be more helpful, I hope, to say more information like uh, during workshop like that. Thank you. Okay.